First, we're going to hear back from the session, uh, the, the, the performance metrics, Rebecca Flora. Thanks for hanging in there. Uh, we've had some great discussions this afternoon. We led, and I want to say we, because we had a whole team of 12 uh, facilitators that were all part of the development of the Pittsburgh performance measures, and I think we have a slide coming up soon. In any event, we had tables broken out to really begin to introduce people to the P4 performance measures and um, first really tell them a little bit about what they are in case you haven't heard of them. Basically, what we've produced over the last year of working together with a, a team of over 100 people developed um, basically a set of 12 measures that we will be using in the city to help evaluate uh, development projects in the city. And the 12 different measures have within them metrics that are providing quantitative ways for us to essentially determine, well, you know, what, how, how do we evaluate air quality in a development project, or how do, we, how do we have a common language for how we think about these different top issues in the, in the area. And so those measures uh, are in a full document that was released earlier this year, and, or now, not this year, last week, um, and the mayor made a pretty pretty astounding announcement that the city would be using those performance measures and um, in evaluating projects. We anticipate those to actually be put into use by January. And over the next couple of months, we have to figure out all the systems that need to be in place around those measures uh, to ensure that the delivery system works and that uh, all of the templates and what kind of training do we need to do and what kind of policies might need to change that might be in the way and create barriers. I mean, all of those, those types of issues. So, so we're really just getting started with the performance measures and I am just simply here really as the person that facilitated and helped bring it together. Um, because there were so many other people involved. This really was something that was developed by the people of Pittsburgh for Pittsburgh, and I really want to make sure we recognize those folks. So anybody that was part of the performance measures team out there over the last year in some way, shape, or form or another, please stand up. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, we couldn't have done it without all of the people that were involved. So now that we have some slides up for me and you know a little bit about the performance measures, let, I'm going to share with you what we did in our session. Um, presented them first, but really interestingly, what we did to sort of give people a chance to start kind of, you know, sticking their toe in the water, understanding we had a table set up for each and every one of the 12 measures. We had subject matter expert facilitators at each of those tables who basically then um, worked the table through a scenario, a project scenario to determine how would that project score using the air measure at the air table or the rainwater measure at the rainwater table. So each table came back with a group score for that project based on the scenario that they were given. And that score, as you can see, nice project, not too bad. Um, score is a 10-point basis on each of the different measures. And uh, you can see it was a little low on opportunity, really high on community, high on public. But just gives, it was really more just to sort of get people using these measures. The next part of this exercise that we did, um, the second exercise, is really pretty interesting. And it's the one that is most valuable to us as we continue with this performance measures work that we're doing. And that really tells it all. We ask the groups to each within their measure to identify where we think Pittsburgh is now as a baseline for that measure that they were working on at their table. And you can see that the highest ones were around land and connect, both around five. The economy table couldn't quite come together to figure out where we were in economy. I think it's partly because we use a particular metric that's a little difficult. Um, but sadly, uh, air, opportunity, community, really low scoring. And that was a group sitting around a table trying to determine where we think we are now. Um, the next thing I asked them to do, and actually I, I raised the bar from three to five years, we asked them, where would we like to be in five years? And realistically, where could we be in five years if we were using this evaluation method to begin to assess, and we heard about that 
500 acres of, of uh, development that's out there, if we started to applying it to all the development in the city, where could we be in five years? Very interestingly, um, there were people, think big. They said, we want to be at 10 and we think we can do it in five years. Love it. Um, the lowest score in here was around air uh, and energy in terms of, you know, the, the increment that we need to get to. And it was, it was just, you know, the table's discussing in a very short time frame, but I think it begins to give us a little bit of a sense of where we're at, where we could be, and how this new tool that we have could help us get there. And that was pretty much what we did. And then I asked them one final question. I said, how could your measure help advance and improve the lives of disadvantaged populations? And we had them write that all down in a card and just a couple of quick things, because I know we need to move on the report out. But not surprisingly, if people have poor air quality and they have asthma, it's really hard to study in school and to do well in school. It's really hard to do well in the workplace. And so air, clearly more attention to air makes a big difference. Energy, if we can lower energy and utility bills, that means that there's more money available in, in, in people's household incomes to be able to use in other ways. Um, and those are just a couple of examples. Design crossed over with community, clearly, because to the extent that we really think about creating places for community to come together. Um, the innovation table was pretty interesting. The innovation table said Transform transformative projects remove barriers. And so we have an innovation measure, and we feel like that could really help in those areas. I don't have time to read off all of them, but we have them collected, and we think there was some very, very information, good information that came out of the session. And thank you for letting us share it, and thank you to all the facilitators and everyone involved with, uh, with us working through this session. Thank you. See, this is what happens when you bring sharp minds together to think about some of these challenges that we have. All right, so the next group, uh, Richard Obermeyer and his team, featuring Scott and Christy, to talk about the T Pittsburgh 2025 session. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so next slide. So in our session in Pittsburgh 2025, a, a new vision for growth. Um, there were kind of four areas that we talked about. Uh, we broke our, our teams. We had 150 people participating. Uh, we had four general areas that you see here, equity inclusion, uh, growing, retaining, attracting firms, looking at placemaking, quality of life, and infra infrastructure and systems. Um, so again, 150 people. And then under each one of these, we had other ideas. So there were about 12 different table topics uh, that we worked on, came up with over 60 prioritized I ideas that are very actionable. We're not developing a report on this. We're trying to move forward with it. So I'll turn it over. All right, so the process for getting there, um, we had uh, anywhere from eight, four, six, eight people sitting at each table. Each table had a question that was very focused. How might we? How might we welcome diverse peoples to Pittsburgh? How might we help startup businesses grow and, and hire and provide employment? Um, and uh, the people at the table uh, discussed that question, discussed all what they were already doing around that question, and then also went in to do a matrix uh, similar to many of the other sessions where they were trying to come up with lots of ideas, and then those ideas were rolled up uh, through voting into uh, specific cards for actionable ideas. Got one. Got one. So, uh as we said, we had a number of ideas. We just had an overwhelming number of ideas to pick from, so we just grabbed a few. So Rich and I, uh, uh, and I will go through these. So first, we uh, had an idea about making Pittsburgh the world center for autonomy. So we obviously know that with Uber's driverless cars being tested here and CMU's great skill set, that this is an area of excellence. But how do we build this into a, a core economic function of the city? So the idea was, how do you create these wraparound services around legal, intellectual property, management, manufacturing. How do we actually manufacture these things here and provide huge numbers of jobs? Finance, regulatory climate, really make Pittsburgh the global place where you do everything related to autonomy. 
And then the next area, one of the other areas that we uh, heard as a recommended idea is really developing new success narratives, really looking at, you know, talking to the community about different uh, measures and metrics in terms of what does success look like, and trying to help students think about success. Part of that is around life planning skills and programs. So, we were, so across the board, we thought about the, the four Ps. Um, so obviously, you heard a couple around sort of the, the place and the people and the placemaking type of activity. And so uh, we covered all those as part of it, and these are just a couple examples. So thanks. And then the last one, I, I think we had some technical difficulties uploading it, so I'll just tell you. Uh, so there's a lot of talk about entrepreneurship, uh, obviously, in our group around, uh, around uh, innovation. And so a, a idea that was floated was how do we get startups that are, are past maybe the first level and need to get to the second level of, of getting their first customers, test betting ideas. So the idea emerged of creating an Innovation Works 2.0. Innovation Works is the, is the entrepreneurial uh, accelerator program here. In, in Pittsburgh, and so how do we, that's world famous, so how do we take that for you know, young startups and build up the ladder so we start employing people in, in the entrepreneurial sector? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our session on creating housing opportunity and building mixed income neighborhoods, this is a challenge for Pittsburgh and a lot of cities and we put some other sharp people on that. We're gonna hear from Matt Barron from the Heinz Endowments and Nate Bishop from Maya Design. Hello. Um, so we had a, a great session looking at the topic of affordable housing and mixed income communities, obviously an incredibly important topic, both in Pittsburgh and around the country right now. Um, we had a great panel with Mercedes Marquez, Angela Blanchard, who spoke earlier today, and Celeste Scott, an affordable housing organizer with Pittsburgh United. And we really wanted to look at, you know, what are those things other than housing that make a strong mixed income community? So we had our groups um, pose a, an initial question of what would affordable housing in a just Pittsburgh look like? And what were those other services and other amenities and other sort of neighborhood things that needed to be wrapped around that to make it work? Um, we had some great conversation. We generated over 400 ideas of what that might look like. And then we moved into a creative matrix session that Nate will talk a little bit about. Yeah, so we, uh, to carve out a few areas of focus for, for uh, generating those ideas, um, we came up with uh, three uh, challenge questions of how might we protect communities from displacement, how might we ensure healthy, accessible housing for those who need it, and how might we give citizens more of a voice in the development process. And then thinking of those three questions uh, as enablers, we used uh, planning, policy, transportation, and uh, uh, economic development uh, so that we could focus on how the intersection of those uh, those questions and those enablers rather than just try to come up with the, the golden ticket that solves it all. Um, and that, through that, we had, uh, I think, 14 tables with about seven people each. And uh, in that round, it came up with another, I think each table had, I don't remember the math exactly, but uh, came up to around 500 uh, different ideas uh, in a 15-minute uh, Creative Matrix session. So. Everyone was uh, awesomely engaged and a bunch of lively conversation that we're going to capture uh, some of those details later and, and do some synthesis. Yep, thank you to everyone who participated. We had council members, developers, community activists, a really diverse and uh, just robust discussion. Thank you. All right, we have two sessions left to report out on this one. Uh, I don't have my notes. This one, uh, next session is, uh, the, the slides still aren't up. But anyway, the, uh, it's Paul and Phil, <laughs> and they're gonna report out on what happened in their session on the most livable city uh, and wrestling with the challenges of environmental and public health. Phil and Paul.
boy, was this one interesting. Um, this is this is a really large-scale challenge with uh, many, many facets and dimensions to consider. Uh, air, water, transportation, economy, many different dimensions. And we were prompted uh, with the subject matter experts in the room, Phil included, to think about uh, some of the things that everybody heard in the earlier sessions uh, today. Things like, um, as we're trying to generate solutions, how do we think personally about this? How do we think about things that are truly transformative? Um, how do we think about things that are new that we haven't tried yet before? How do we work at the intersections of, of uh, organizations and, and other entities that normally don't work together? So after we worked our way through the activities, um, we ended up, I think, bubbling up uh, three very different clear areas of gravity and, and focus. Um, that were about really practical ways for how to accomplish uh, achieving healthy and safe environments and healthy and safe communities. So, Phil, what did, what did we end up with? Uh, we, 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 we were able to pull this down to about three different categories. Um, the first was meaningful design. Um, how can we purposefully, meaningfully design our environment to reduce the potential for impacts. And some examples are, are walking and biking access to parks and smarter transit and integrated transit options that, that encourage and, and give space to the pedestrian, for example, as well as uh, a deeper level of investment in, in the built environment so that we can, uh, we, we can have smart transportation, traffic signalization, areas for people to be outside to get to and from work and school. Our second category that we, uh, that we reached was um, generally referring to uh, what folks called actual community representation. Um, this would be uh, authentic and real community participation in all the important things that our societies do to manage our environmental and health affairs. Examples include, um, this one was great, including kids in planning and decision making uh, that our communities engage in, uh, more town hall meetings to discuss environmental justice and sustainability, um, community representation in negotiations, in regulatory negotiations when enforcing permits for air, air quality and water quality performance. And then the third final category that, that really pulled together a lot of different themes and thoughts gets to the um, people plugging into our future. Um, there are a lot of great ideas here, including, for example, jobs training in the region for sustainable energy uh, and manufacturing. Uh, the economy around remediation. There are a lot of homes, for example, in schools that um, could be, uh, we could eliminate toxic hazards from these environments. And th th these are actually, this is a whole sector of employment. Another one was, um, thinking about children and making their environments, whether it be in their schools or their playgrounds, toxic free and safe. And, and then engaging um, children in activities which really give them a sense of, of meaning and purpose as, as it relates to the environment. And one example was uh, a summer camp around the theme of air quality. So those were our three categories that we, uh, that we worked toward. Thank you. See, if I would have had my Bobby Brown TED Talk ready, I wouldn't have stumbled in that last one. All right, so the final report out today is from the Pittsburgh's creatives and their role in P4. And this one for me has an, an important, it resonates with me for, I'm not gonna spend too much time with this. Uh, about 10 years ago, I spent some time with a delegation from China they came to Penn State, and they were concerned about the Chinese, like a lot of Asian countries, had spent decades investing in STEM. And they wanted to catch up with the West. And what they missed was by neglecting arts, they had no creative people in their society. They had neglected nurturing that part of the society. And so as a result, they weren't innovating anything. They had this tremendous machine that could produce. They had the people, but they couldn't innovate. They couldn't create anything. We can't afford to forget how important this is, that creative element. 
And so for this one, uh, Janet and Megan are going to talk and report out from that session. But this piece here about the role of the creatives, we can't drop that piece. I think Janet and Megan are coming up. Yep, they're ready. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Janet Sarbaugh from the Heinz Endowments. I want to thank you for, for sticking with us, and I want to tell you a little bit about um, Pittsburgh's creative session. Um, we had the good fortune of having a room of very smart uh, leaders in the cultural sector, um, and we went from soup to nuts on what the connections are between the P4 principles, all aspects of P4 that we heard today, and Pittsburgh's creative community, all the way from human development to community revitalization to the built environment. Um, and I want to give a special shout out to um, the three panelists that presented today, Julie Malice from Boom Concepts in Garfield, Janira Solomon from KST in East Liberty, and Bonnie Young-Lang from the Hill Consensus Group in the Hill District. I think their work really exemplified the kind of work that we want to see done in neighborhoods in Pittsburgh where culture is ubiquitous and part of the positive story of neighborhoods. I'm Megan Guidi, and I'm from Maya Design. And some very interesting things came up in our session. Uh, we started off with great information from our panelists who talked to us about three big concepts that really helped to inspire our groups as we worked through the, the brainstorming activities. Uh, the first idea was around place keeping and the notion of making sure that we're creating spaces in our communities that not only are a space, um, but are appropriate to the legacy of the arts in that area. Uh, the next idea was really around place making. So it was about creating spaces for artists to be in and making sure that those artists have the resources to be there. Uh, and lastly, we heard uh, from the Kelly Strayhorn Theater, and they had this great uh, idea where they, they call themselves an organization of yes. And they're trying to say yes to as many things and as many ideas uh, as they possibly can, which was really inspiring, ex inspiring and exciting. So, everyone that was in a group, I'm sure, generated hundreds and hundreds of ideas. We did the same thing, and we were focused on three main questions. The first was, how might we use artists and cultural activity to revitalize communities? The next was, how might we ensure access to, cre to a creative life to every Pittsburgher? And finally, we looked at how might we use arts and cultural programs to address inequalities. And we really did have hundreds of ideas, and it was really difficult to narrow this down. Um, but we had four big buckets that we saw rising to the top of ideas that we thought were really important. The first was this notion of having an appointed person, whether it was a, a, a government person or whether it was an identified community person, who could take the lead on, uh, on community arts in, in the city. And so this card was emblematic, this notion of, uh, of a minister of the arts for Pittsburgh. Uh, the next idea was to make very clear cultural spaces available in every neighborhood to be doing the types of things that, that our artists talked about, uh, providing spaces for artists, making sure that artists know about these spaces and have the resources to work uh, in, these, in these open spaces. Next was the notion of really enforcing the 1% art and development projects. This came up on a lot of note cards and was really, really important to our creative community. And lastly, we had a lot of conversation around public school uh, programming for the arts and how important it is to make sure that arts are a part of the public school uh, programs and making sure that artists have a place in public schools and are able to get into public schools. And that was our session. Good evening, stalwarts. Give yourself a round of applause for sticking all the way through. So my job is just in the last few minutes to wrap up. And what I'd like to do is just leave you with some general thoughts about what I observed, hopefully consistent with what you observed, 
If it's not, it's okay. Uh, I think we'll all bring a different perspective to the work and what we heard today. You know, a, a session like this is a little frustrating because it's simultaneously too much and too little. You sort of feel like we packed way too much into the day and at the same time like we barely scratched the surface. And I think that's how it's meant to be when you get into something as rich as this. Uh, so let me just touch on a few highlights. I, I, um, I can't do this without acknowledging at the front end what was simultaneously the funniest and meanest tweet of the entire conference, which was a photo of our mayor. I wish he was here because I could do this then in front of him. But a photo of our mayor in his sweater that said, I am not Ken Bone. <laughs> that was just priceless and, and, and started us in style because it just shows the, the mood of the group. Be careful. Uh, but I also loved how, how the mayor opened this. You know, he sort of threw down the gauntlet of, with, with that video of his um, that Pittsburgh, if it's not for all, it's not for us. It was the right theme, I think, for the day and, and the right challenge. Uh, and what we saw, actually, in quick succession was a number of reminders about the long-term consequences of getting this moment that we're in wrong. So, Andre Hines sharing the video that he did, and you gotta love that video um, and the self-importance of the announcer talking about how the city elders, city fathers, of course, had completely reinvented the city and how proud they were of things that we now, looking back upon it, say, gee, we wish they hadn't done that. Uh, it's a reminder, I thought, a great reminder of, a, of the reason for humility as we approach this work. And the things that we all think we know for sure are things that maybe we ought to pause and reflect on. We heard Richard Jackson talk about that in terms of um, how social policy, uh, how, how urban planning and urban design are actually social policy written into concrete. So the long-term consequences of getting it wrong have solid manifestation in our community. And John Wallace did such an amazing job, as he always does, in reminding us of the stakes of who we're fighting for and, and what happens to real people if we get it wrong. Just that one statistic, about 62% of the African-American children in the city being in poverty, compared to about 15% of white children. Extraordinary disparity that cannot stand. So then we got coupled with this reminder about the, um, the long-term consequences of getting it wrong, I think a number of calls to action, and they were all, uh, I think, inspiring and amazing. None, though, quite as powerful as Jaziri X's incredible piece. Uh, and I love his phrase. I love a whole bunch of, of the uh, phrases in there. But this notion of bound to resist will stick with me, that there is a need uh, an, uh, an, an impulse to, to resist the status quo and what we are experiencing and seeing. ta Coates in his book Between the World and Me um, uses a phrase that the universe favors verbs over nouns. And I think that was the message in a way of Jaziri X's uh, performance piece. But it was the message too in a, uh, in, of, of Mayor Greg Fisher's presentation you know, he spent a lot of time talking about compassion, but what he was really talking about was engagement around compassion. And his admonition to not be a couch from the critic, I hope, is one that we'll take into the community with us. Latasha Mays, I think, reminded us of, of a way in which we may not think about uh, environmental challenges from a justice standpoint, but that too was part of our call to action today. As we, as we built on that call to action, Angela Glover Blackwell, in the beautiful poetic way that she always does, reminded us of this core concept, that place really matters. So this place that we're fighting for, this notion that we call Pittsburgh, really matters. And her, her idea, rooted in data, that where you are born and where you live is a proxy for opportunity in our community is one we should remember as we go back out into the community after tomorrow. I loved, um, in, this, in this context, uh, as well, Karen Abrams, and by the way, it was so great to have her back in town. Um, 
But, but the same reminder from her about, about the importance of place. Now, what we're, what we're reminded of as well, though, by our speakers is that even as we're thinking about the importance of place and the value of preserving what's unique about Pittsburgh, there's a lot of discussion about how we have to put people at the center of that. And I, I, I'll, I'll remember a lot of what our speaker said, Majestic Lane talking at length about putting people at the center of neighborhoods, if that's how we want to see them reinvented, putting kids at the center. There was a lot of energy on Twitter around that. Uh, Angela Blackwell, Blanchard, though, with her, her, a couple of comments that she made um, will really stick with me in this context for a while. She talked about how the measure of a great city is who it welcomes. What a lovely idea that it's not just who's there, but who we welcome. That's a reflection of us. And also her admonition to never make the place more precious than the people. So let's take that. Even as we're remembering the importance of the place, let's take away this notion that the place doesn't matter more than the people who live there. So that's actually another theme that we saw come up a lot in these, uh, in the, in the um, speakers' comments today, that the how we do this matters, that there is an art to doing this right. So when we think about how we want to fight this um, in Pittsburgh, that thinking about how we do it and the art of it is important for us. And I loved in that context Liz Ogbu's notion of moving from empower to co-power. So actually embracing the idea of sharing power. Angela Blanchard's lovely notion that leaders, the leaders that we need are already here. So, so often we go looking for different people to come in and lead us and lead the communities that we're working in, but they're already there. And I think just in a human context, the idea that we should be prepared to say I'm sorry, even if we aren't the ones who have committed the wrong, but just to express that basic human connection around I'm sorry was a beautiful thought we should carry with us. There was some beautiful um, thinking that, uh, that, that uh, arrived here on the stage around the notion of data and design. So when we're thinking about how we do this work, the importance of data and the importance of design rose subtly through the ranks, I think, in the comments that we heard. Uh, Tim Dugan offered a bit of a master class for those of you who are paying attention about how we can rethink infrastructure. And I really wish that everybody in our community who's engaged with Alcasan and PWSA and the whole debate over what we're going to do with up to $4 billion of public investment in new, uh, new sewer and water infrastructure would listen to this notion of how we can rethink it in a green fashion. Sepp Kamvar gave another master class in how to use design to rethink pretty much everything, but particularly rethink schools. And what a remarkable notion to turn so much of what we think we know about education completely on its head uh, and use that not only to reinvent schools, but to reinvent interaction with cities. It was actually the takeaway for me from Kai Uwe Bergman's presentation about the lower hill and about Audi. Um, you know, we can make of those pieces what we will, but what he ultimately was talking about was how we use design to rethink connectivity. Really an important notion for us at this moment. And then Bruce Katz, you know, he actually backstage decided we're so far behind, I'm going to throw away my presentation and, and I'm going to come out here and just talk with folks about what I think was important. Um, only he can pull that off the way that he did. But what he encouraged us to do from a design standpoint was to rethink social connectivity. So to put together the amazing resurgence of Pittsburgh that we're seeing around innovation and leverage that to connect the people in the community with it. I guess that covers it. Those were the, the highlights for me. I, wonderful um, takeaways from the groups that we just heard from. Um, we have fewer people in the room now than we did at the beginning of the day. This often happens with, with conferences, um, and I don't know who will show up tomorrow. The right people will show up tomorrow. And I'm going to invite you to be among the right people. 
Uh, the, the plan for tomorrow is to engage in the deeper conversations that the community actually asked us to include in this second iteration of P4, an opportunity for us to take the sort of ideas that I've just framed for you and everything else that you heard that I've missed and translate that into the action agenda we need for Pittsburgh. So I want to thank you so much for uh, persevering through the agenda today, sticking with us and being here in the first place and being here tomorrow as well. I will look forward to seeing you in the morning. Thank you. Thank you.